Welcome back class. So we've talked about different ways and we can categorize a disease. Is it local? Is it systemic? Is it acute? Is it subacute? Um, a whole bunch of terms. Now let's talk about how that disease spreads throughout a person, throughout an individual host. So first let's talk about predisposing factors. Predisposing factors are some characteristic of the host, of your patient, that make their body more susceptible or even less susceptible to a disease. So a predisposing factor can alter how that disease will spread through their body, um, may make them more likely to get an illness. Things like this would be a short urethra in females, just simple biology, that leads to more UTIs in females and in males. Something like an inherited trait, like the sickle cell gene, means that they are less likely to develop malaria. Their climate and their weather, um, being fatigued. So just being so exhausted actually can wear down your immune system and make you more likely to get a lot of diseases. Age, the very young, so younger than like two, don't have very well-developed immune systems and are more likely to develop a lot of diseases. And also the elderly, older than like 65, starts to have a waning immune system and more likely to develop autoimmune, or more likely to develop an infectious disease. The environment and their occupation can make them more or less susceptible to particular illnesses. Having a pre-existing illness, so we just talked about primary infections and secondary infections. Um, having a pre-existing illness can make it more likely for you to develop something like pneumonia. Um, nutrition can affect the immune system and affect be a predisposing factor for a lot of diseases. Lifestyle, lifestyle. So if you have someone engaging in unprotected sex, it is more likely that they are going to be um, developing a sexually transmitted infection. If someone is sharing needles, it is more likely that they will be developing a bloodborne disease. And going through chemotherapy, which can alter their immune system their immune system and response to protect them from disease. Then when a patient has a disease, it's going to go through these kind of five classic stages. One thing I want to point out before we do this is that through all five of these stages, they don't all include signs and symptoms. For some of them, the patient may feel like they are fine, but for all signs of this, all five signs, they are infected. These all include from the first infection appearing to the last infectious particle leaving. Um, so throughout all of these stages, your patient can be able to spread disease. The first is the incubation period. So this is you, your patient drank some contaminated water, your patient sat next to someone who was sick on a school bus. This period between when that first infectious particle got into their body until their first signs and symptoms appear. So in the incubation period, they have no signs and symptoms of being infectious. In the prodromal period, they start to have early mild symptoms. This is typically going to be very short, maybe a few hours up to a day when they're just like, Oh, my body just hurts. I just don't feel like myself. Just, oh, I just feel a little off today. Then they have the period of illness when the disease is most severe. They have very obvious signs and symptoms. My throat is killing me. I definitely have some GI disturbances. I have a raging fever. My lymph nodes are visibly swollen. I have a rash all over my body. Just obvious signs and symptoms. Um... Hopefully, it, this is the time when the patient's immune system starts to kick in and fight the infection, so you go to the period of decline. But if they don't overcome this, that period of illness continues, the patient will die of the infection. Hopefully, though, their immune system then starts battling, they get medical treatment, um, and they start to have those signs and symptoms subside. This is the period of decline. They're, they still have signs, they still have symptoms, but they're not as bad. They're kind of going down. Then the period of convalescence is when they are feeling like themselves again. Their body is functioning. They can talk without 
without their throat hurting. They can eat without throwing up. They don't have a rash anymore. Whatever signs are gone. But they still have those last few infectious particles in their body. They haven't totally eliminated the infection yet. And so they can still spread infection. So it is okay whether you are the boss or the employee. It is okay when you're pay- when someone has been sick that they take a day off after they feel better, take that extra day off, that period of convalescence to make sure that they aren't spreading that disease to their patients or to um, whoever they may be coming in contact with, their coworkers or, or to you. Okay, so here is the incubation period. You have gotten sick with something. Something has gotten into your body, but you don't show any signs and symptoms. You don't have a lot of microbes yet. Um, but those infectious mar- microbes are starting to grow. And eventually there's enough to start showing some gentle signs and symptoms. Um, and that is your prodromal period. Then the period of illness, you have some raging symptoms. You know you are definitely sick. You're going to the doctor. You're getting treated. And then you go into the period of decline. Your treatment's working. Your immune system's fighting it. Um, and then you still have infectious agents here. Look at all these bacteria or viruses or whatever is in your body. They are still there, even though you feel better. So you want to take this last day off from work to not spread that infection. Okay, so what is a predisposing factor? And then the incubation period for a cold is three days and the period of illness is five days. If the person next to you has a cold, will, will, when will you know if you contracted it? So just pretend like we're sitting in class today and I happen to sneeze right in front of you. How long would it take you until you knew if you were sick? How long until you started showing those initial signs and symptoms? Then there's some different ways that infections can spread. Um, A reservoir is just a source, just a a continual source of an infection. A reservoir could be a human or an animal or a non-living. When I think of reservoirs, I think of typhoid Mary. So Mary was a woman living in the Bronx area who, she was a cook. That was what she did for a living. She cooked people's food. Um, and so she was employed in a household for a person, for a family as their chef. Um, but whenever they ate her food, they kept getting typhoid. And eventually they're like, Mary, we love you, but you're fired. You're making my family sick. And Mary was like, um, I'm not sick. I'm not making you sick. You're getting from somewhere, someone else. But they fired her. So she went and started cooking for another family. And wouldn't you know it, but that other family she started working for, they started getting typhoid um, and they fired her. So she went and worked somewhere else. Um, eventually, just everywhere she went, the people that she cared for, the people that she was cooking for were getting sick. Um, eventually, the health department was like, yo, Mary, this isn't cool. Stop cooking. Um, but Mary was like, I'm not sick. I got to make a living. And she kept cooking. Um, people kept getting sick. So eventually she was committed to a hospital. Um, so she couldn't be cooking for any people, for people anymore. So typhoid, typhoid Mary was a human reservoir. She was a carrier. She didn't have any signs of illness, but she was spreading illness. Um, other diseases I think of with human carriers would be something like HIV. A person could have no signs or symptoms of HIV, but if they're having unprotected sex with people, they can spread HIV. Gonorrhea, also an STI that you, Your patient may not have signs and symptoms, but it can still spread. Hepatitis, which can be both um, like through needle sharing or as an STI or even other ways that hepatitis can spread. Or amoebic dysentery, um, which is a GI infection. Um, Dysentery means bloody diarrhea that someone without signs and symptoms could secrete that amoeba into a water source and then carry it to everyone. When an animal is your reservoir, it's called a zoonosis. So that root word zoo in there should make you think of animals. Um, And so the animal is carrying a disease that can then be transmitted to humans. Something like rabies carried by many mammals, Lyme disease carried by ticks, Um, even something like Ebola or Marburg disease that could be carried by fruit bats. And there can be non-living reservoirs, something like infected soil, contaminated water, or even food that's not been stored properly or not been prepared properly. Something like botulism, which is a type of food poisoning, tetanus, 
or ringworm. When the disease is spreading between people, it's called contact transmission. Direct means that you have two people directly making physical contact. So they're touching each other, they're kissing, they're having sexual intercourse. This would be something like how influenza spreads, staph infections, sexually transmitted diseases, or mononucleosis. Indirect transmission means it's going between two people, but it's stopping off at something that's non-living. It's going from an infected person to a fomite to an infected person. Fomite should be a term you remember from our first week of lab. It's a non-living material that's used to transmit a disease. So someone is sick, they blow their nose in a tissue, drop the tissue on the floor. Someone comes up, picks up the tissue, throws it away. They've gotten their germs on you. Um, a kid is sick, licks the elevator button, you touch it, and now you have that disease. That's an indirect transmission. Then droplet transmission is when the disease is traveling on a drop, a drop of moisture. So something like coughing, sneezing, laughing, talking, those moisture particles from your breath are going to spread into the air. But they're only going to go a short distances because gravity is very quickly going to pull it down to the ground. This is how things like influenza, pneumonia, and pertussis, or whooping cough, can spread. Droplet, though I want you to pay attention, this is short distances compared to airborne, which is not short distances. So droplet transmission, um, it was a big deal when COVID was going around. Was it going through COVID? Was it going through droplet transmission or was it going through airborne transmission? Because droplet transmission means you put on a mask, you socially distance, you're protected from it. Airborne transmission would mean social distancing would not have any effect. So that was a big um, debate when we were still learning about COVID. Um, does it make any sense to social distance or not? You may remember that being a, a hot topic for a while. So here's some examples of direct contact. They're touching each other. If she has a staph infection on her hand, she just spread it to her friend. Here's some indirect transmission. So here is a thermometer a glass, an inhaler, tissues, um, you know, any of these things. I'm not sure what these test strips or something are. Um, any of these things, if they are, if a person with an infection touched them and got their infectious disease agents on those and then the next person touched it, it could spread. And then droplet transmission is she's sneezing, achoo, it's going everywhere. All these particles of moisture carrying those germs, but it's going to be carried down. Um, and out of the air. Then vehicle. So vehicle, I think of my car is a vehicle. It is not alive. So vehicle transmission are things that are not alive. This could include water, food, air, blood, fluids, drugs. Um, if it is waterborne, riding on that vehicle of water, this could be something like sewage. Uh, untreated or poorly treated sewage is getting into the water source could spread things like cholera or shigella. If it's food borne, this would be things like food is not completely cooked. Food was cooked, but then left out on the table, not refrigerated. Or food was prepared with unsanitary conditions. So dirty cooking utensils, the chef didn't wash their hands. This could lead to food poisoning or tapeworm infestation. And then airborne. Airborne is when it travels on the dust. That dust is just lightweight and stays suspended in the air. So it travels more than a meter from the host. So it can stay in the air for longer periods of time. So this would mean not just the person sitting next to you sneezed, but someone came in and was sick a week ago and it's still in the air. Tuberculosis and measles can spread through airborne transmission. So here this guy is drinking from this water. Um, if it's untreated, he could be sick. Here he is brushing up dust particles into the air as he sweeps and can spread infection and here food. Hopefully this cutting board is clean, her knife is clean, her hands are clean. Um, ho hopefully she cleans them after preparing food or it could spread disease. So vehicle, like your car is not alive, vehicle is using not, not living things to transfer disease. Vectors are using animals. So vectors are living things that are going to carry pathogens from one host to another. Our main vectors are going to involve arthropods, Arthropods involve insects, um, arachnids, animals, invertebrates that have a shell, and jointed legs. That's what makes an arthropod. Our main arthropods we see a lot are fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. These are not the only vectors, but these are the main vectors we see a lot, fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. 
There's two types of vector transmission. One is mechanical transmission, where an infection just passively rides on a bug. So if this fly was flying around, landed where a dog had left its droppings, landed on the droppings, picked up some infection, and then traveled here to your hamburger, it could be transferring infection. Biological transmission is a more active trans process where this mosquito bites a person who is infected. Um, the pathogen is going to reproduce inside of the vector, so lives out part of its life cycle inside the mosquito. And then as the mosquito travels to the next host, it can bite the next host and transfer it. Um, it could also pass on the infection through feces, vomit, or saliva from that animal. So something like West Nile or malaria, that an insect bite is what is going to transfer that pathogen to you. If the animal just lands on you, it's not harmful. It's not until it actually actively bites you or gets part of its body fluids into your body. Okay, so now can you tell me, why are carriers an important reservoir of infection? Carriers being something like typhoid Mary, a person. How are zoonoses transmitted to humans? And give me some examples of contact transmission, vehicle transmission, mechanical transmission, and biological transmission. All right, I'll see you back. We'll start talking about nosocomial infections. That's a fun one. Okay, bye.